everyone, and once again, welcome to our service today. This morning, we will be continuing with our look at the book of Ecclesiastes, and today we're going to be looking at chapter 7, talking a little bit about some of the things that Solomon has to share with us there. And the title of my sermon today is called Paradox. And uh, how many people know what paradox means? Lots of hands, even among our new speakers. Okay, Freddie has basis here. Freddie, what does paradox mean? It means a contradiction. Okay, yeah, a contradiction. Paradox is a situation or a statement which seems to contradict itself. Two things which are in apparent conflict with each other. Um, an example of a paradox would be an actor who likes to be famous. He likes people to recognize and to know him. He's, he wants to be famous, but he doesn't like to have people talking with him about his private life. Uh, when he's not on the stage, when he's not performing, when he's not giving an interview, he doesn't like the fans. Stay away, leave me alone. I want my privacy. <laughs> that is a paradox. Another example of a paradox is a computer. A computer is supposed to save us time, yet often we spend a lot of time trying to fix them and get them to work properly. They break down, there are problems with software. We often spend a lot of time setting up computers and fixing computers when they are supposed to save us time. That's another example of a paradox. And in chapter 7 of Ecclesiastes, uh, Solomon talks about some paradoxes, some situations or cases which, when we first look at these ideas or these statements, they might seem a little strange or unusual or paradoxical to us. And this morning I'd like to look at a few of these together for a few minutes and talk a little bit about the meaning behind what Solomon was trying to say. And uh, it starts out with chapter uh, 7 with verse 1. He talks about a good name is better than perfume and the day of death better than the day of birth. How many of you want to die? Any, anyone looking forward to dying? <laughs> no, often when we, we talk about life and lifespan, people think about, oh, I wish I could go back. <laughs> uh, there are lots of books and movies and stories about traveling back in time. Not too many about going forward. <laughs> Usually we're wanting to go back and repeat or redo something in our past. And so at first glance, what Solomon has to say about beginning of life and the end of life and tying this to our reputation might seem a little bit paradoxical. But um, Solomon is simply saying that at the beginning of life, people don't really know anything about us. We have not made a name for ourselves. We have not done anything or accomplished anything yet. And at the end of life, all of our accomplishments, all of that what we've done is a, a, a lasting memorial, something that we can be remembered by. If you are a baby and you're born and you die immediately, no one's going to know anything about you. You're not going to be remembered for anything. And of course Solomon was thinking in, of his own case, his own situation. Um, and as he looked back on his life, he had many regrets, of course, and Ecclesiastes deals a lot with this. But he also realized that he had done a lot of good things. And in his final years, he had repented and had tried to uh, repair some of the damage that he had done in his foolish years. And so his first paradox, uh, contrasting beginning and end of life, Solomon thought that... Uh, it wasn't such a bad thing to face the end of life. Now, the second paradox that he talks about is found in verse 2. 
It's better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. For the death is the destiny of every man, and living should take this to heart. How many people like going to parties? No, nobody likes going to parties. <laughs> this time of year, right? Bonenkai, lots of parties. You know, schools and groups and companies. and you know, I have different people saying, Oh, we're having a party, please come at this time. I'm looking at my calendar, okay. <laughs> Trying to fit these all in. Uh, most people like parties. And Japanese enjoy outings. Uh, Japanese have many excuses for parties. Oh, it's uh, you know, uh, somebody's birthday, or oh, somebody's leaving, or somebody's coming, or uh, oh, it's uh, fall, uh, the, the leaves are falling, let's go out and look at the leaves and, and have a small party, or oh, it's uh, cherry blossom time, let's go and <laughs> enjoy the leaves and, and have some food and some drink together. But Japanese enjoy socializing. And uh, enjoy spending time with co-workers and family and friends. Although, sometimes people don't enjoy it. It's an obligation, maybe. <laughs> but uh, generally, people like to spend time together having a good time, socializing. So it would seem a little strange that Solomon says, that's not such a good thing. How many people like going to funerals? <laughs> no, yeah, most of us don't enjoy funerals. Funerals are usually kind of sad, depressing. We are missing the person who has died. Uh, we are seeing the sorrow and feeling the pain of the people that were close to that person. Most of us don't enjoy going to funerals. I don't enjoy going to funerals. And yet, Solomon, in this paradox, says that this time of mourning is better than a time of feasting. And Solomon's explanation is quite simple, that all of us are going to have to face death and problems in life. It is inevitable <coughs> that we are going to have to deal with difficult times. And it's important that we learn to be able to face and accept sorrow and difficulty. It's very easy to escape. <laughs> oh, let's laugh and have a good time. and, and uh, you know, we have the expression in English, uh, you know, eat, drink, and be merry, <laughs> or tomorrow you will die. <laughs> you know, enjoy it now, because, you know, you don't know what's going to happen the next day. But, uh, you know, as Christians, we need to, to learn to realize that there's going to be a lot of hard times in our lives. Life is not always going to be easy. And learning to accept those difficulties and to live with those difficulties and to understand that these trials and sorrows and sadness that come into our lives is something which we can gain strength from and build ourselves up with. God does not give us trials which we cannot survive. God gives us the strength for any of these circumstances that come. And these are often a chance for us to develop and build our character, a chance to witness to other people. We have the very famous story of Job, right? Job had many troubles and many trials and many difficulties, which he did not understand. And his friends did not understand. But it was an opportunity for Job to witness to God as he refused to give up on his relationship with him. Sometimes the world looks at Christians and thinks that we are kind of stupid or silly. You know, oh, you have all of these troubles and trials or you have difficulties. How can you live as a Christian? Or how can you believe in God when all of these bad things happen? How can you believe that God is a God of love when we see all of these um, terrible disasters and tragedies surrounding us each day. And of course, we know that God allows terrible things to happen sometimes. We don't always know why, and as in the case of the story of Job, God is not going to explain himself to us. We have to 
learn to trust, believe, and to follow what He lays out for us each day. We don't have to worry about why this is working or why this has happened. That's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to prepare ourselves and to prepare other people around us to support people as they need it and to share what we know about God with other people. Now, in verses 5 through 7, Solomon makes another interesting paradox. It's better to heed a wise man's rebuke than to listen to the song of fools. Like the crackling of thorns under the pot, so is the last of fools. This too is meaningless. How many people like to be scolded? Anyone like to be scolded? Or corrected, oh, you did this wrong? <laughs> How many people like, like that? We all like to hear, oh, you did a good job. Oh, what a wonderful, oh, that's great, fantastic. We all like to hear praise. We don't like to hear correction. It's our human nature. Uh, many years ago, I was playing golf with my father and my grandfather. And I am not a good golfer. But I like it. It's just fun. You know? I like hitting the ball. and Sometimes it goes straight. And every time I hit the ball, my grandfather was like, you know, you should hold the club, you know, this way. <laughs> I was like, just let me enjoy my game. <laughs> I didn't come out here to be corrected after every stroke because I make a lot of strokes, you know, lots of correction. I didn't want to hear his advice. I knew that I wasn't doing it perfectly, but I didn't want to listen to him telling me that I was doing it wrong. I knew I was doing it wrong. I didn't want it repeated to me again and again and again and again and again. We don't like correction. It's our nature. Even when we make mistakes, we don't like people pointing them out, especially publicly in front of other people. And yet, correction is very important. We do need to know what our mistakes are. We do need to realize the error of our ways. And even though we would rather hear praise than correction, which is more beneficial? Correction. Correction is more beneficial. Now, in, as Christians, we have a responsibility to correct each other. The Bible tells us that if we see our brother in error, that we have a responsibility to, to help them, to guide them back into the correct path. But we also need to be careful with how we do that. Sometimes we are a little too critical in how we talk with people. So we need to learn diplomatic, tactful ways of helping those that we see in trouble. Because, well, as I said, nobody likes to be corrected. And the natural response is going to be often hostile, especially if we're in a very critical, um, uh, sometimes patronizing or superior way. So we need to be careful with how we offer correction to those around us. But we do have a responsibility to do so when and where we can. So correction is important. We need to be open to correction and willing to accept it when it comes because that is how we are able to improve. Often we may not see the mistake that we are making. Um, and that person's counsel or advice can be quite beneficial for us. In verse 8, Solomon makes the comment, the end of the matter is better than the beginning. The end is better than the beginning. Well, once again, at first glance, that might seem a little bit strange. 
Um, when you read a book, do you start at the end? Some people do. <laughs> I have friends like, oh yeah, so I always like to read the last page first. And I want to know what the, how the story is going to end. And then I start at the beginning. The end, of course, is the final result. And in life, that is what we need to focus on. Paul talks about, in the race, my eye is on the mark, the, the finish line, the goal. I'm not, I'm not looking at the track as I'm racing. I'm not looking around to see where the other runners are. I'm looking at straight ahead for my objective, for my goal. If you look around, naturally you're going to go off course or off track or slow down. If you are a track star, if you're a track runner, coaches will tell you always look ahead. Don't look around because when you do that, your body naturally loses its pace and stride and you slow down. You lose time. You lose a step and the other person may pass you. As Christians, we have to keep focused on our goal because the race that we are running, the experiences we are going through, if we focus on those, we are going to get discouraged and depressed and sidetracked. There are a lot of terrible things that happen in this life, as we mentioned before. And if we focus on all of these problems instead of the final goal, we are going to get overwhelmed. When we keep our eye fixed on the prize, when we keep in mind what we are gaining, then the troubles and the trials that we have each day are going to seem less important and less significant. It's very easy, like, oh, I have this problem with work, or oh, what am I going to do about this? But if we are patient, if we remember that God is in control, and God will provide answers to these problems, as long as we stay on the path, and as long as we keep aiming and walking and running towards the prize, that is what we need to focus on. And if we do that, then we have nothing to worry about. Solomon talks quite a bit in these verses, um, contrasting the proud and the patient, the angry and the patient. And uh, in the world today, uh, a lot of people value pride. You know, it's important to be proud of yourself and uh, to be assertive, to, to know your place and to promote yourself. In Western culture, that's very important. Uh, you need to have a very positive self-image. And there's nothing wrong with um, having a positive view of yourself. You have to love yourself in order to love other people. And the golden rule says, love your neighbor as yourself. If you don't have a positive view of yourself, you're not going to have a positive view of other people. However, to, to go too far with this results in pride. And of course, pride was the original sin. Satan became proud. He looked at himself. He looked at what God had given him, and he looked at the other angels and said, Oh, I'm better than them. <laughs> you know? I, I, I'm pretty powerful. I am beautiful. I have all of these skills and talents, and I will be like God. You know, we read about that in Isaiah, where he talks about these, I will do this, and I, I, I. He focused on himself. And he, he got caught up in his own skills and talents, abilities. And uh, 
that led him into trouble. Pride goes before the fall. Pride leads to many, many problems. Humility. Humility is not something that comes natural to us. Often when we hear the word humble, we have kind of a mixed idea about it. It's like, well, like simple, poor, not so good. Like, oh, it's a humble house. Oh, it's really small and poor. Or, he's a humble man. Oh, you know, he's nothing. No one's so special. And again, there's a paradox of paradox there with humility. Because even in Japan, Japan puts a high premium on humility in your society and in your culture. And, uh, and yet, although we put a high value on that, people are not often humble. I am proud that I'm humble. <laughs> Oh, my house is very simple, and I'm proud of it. <laughs> you know, what we say, false humility. False humility. But the true humility that we must learn to, to nurture and to embrace as Christians is the humility as, as uh, sh shown us by Christ. And, and, of course, the ultimate expression of his humility was when he washed the feet of his disciples, taking the role of a servant. And Jesus preached this constantly. What did he say? The first shall be last, and the last will be first. The greatest will be the least. Humility does not come naturally to us. It, uh, it requires uh, work and patience and, uh, and self-sacrifice. We have to be willing to, um, to, to give up our pride and to not be concerned about what people might say about us if we are going to be a truly humble person and live in a truly humble way. These paradoxes that we've looked at this morning are a few examples that Solomon presented describing how things that the world sees and the way that God sees are not the same. And this is what Paul talked about in the scripture reading that we looked at, if you'll turn again to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul actually talks about this quite a bit in, uh, from verses 18 down through, actually into chapter 2. Paul says that the world and the world's view does not equal God's. And that God often uses things which seem paradoxical, things which seem foolish or weak, in order to <coughs> teach and to share the truth and to do what is right and what is strong. As Christians, we have to realize that the world and our ideas of what are valuable and what is right are never going to be equal. The things that the world puts value on are temporary. The things that God puts value on are permanent. And God uses simple things to test us. We go back to the Old Testament, stories of Naaman, you know, the man who had leprosy, the Syrian general. And uh, he came to Israel looking to be healed. And 
he came to the king, right? He thought, well, the king, he's the head of the country. The king said, no, don't come to me. I, I don't know anything about this. So he ended up going to the house of the prophet. And uh, he got to the house, and what happened? Did the prophet come out to see him? No, a servant. A simple servant, not even in very nice clothes. Just some hired man came out like, Sorry, he's busy, he doesn't have time to talk with you. But, here's a message. You know, just go down to the River Jordan. Anywhere is okay. And just wash in the river seven times. And you will be healed. And, of course, as you remember the story, he became very angry. You know, I came all this way, I have all of my, my guards and my aides and my servants, my whole parade of people with me, I have all these gifts, and you're turning me away. And you're telling me to go wash in this dirty river. He got upset. His pride. His pride prevented him from understanding what was happening. But fortunately, his servants, they had a little more common sense and more wisdom. So they reasoned with him. You know, it's like, well, if he told you to do something difficult, would you have done it? Hmm. Yes, I guess I would. Well, what do you have to lose? And so Naaman followed the directions. And by doing these simple, kind of foolish things, he was healed. God uses the simple to test. He uses what the world considers foolish or crazy or stupid to prove his power to those who will accept and follow what he has to say. And so in closing this morning, Paradoxes. As Christians, we have to realize that what we do and how we live is viewed as a paradox by the world. They think that we are strange. They don't accept how we think and how we live. And we are going to have to realize that the world will never accept us for what we are. They will never sympathize with our lifestyle. They will always believe we are a little strange or a little crazy. And we can't let the opinion of the world, of our family, of our friends, of our co-workers, we can't allow that to turn us aside from the path from which we're walking. We need to keep our eyes fixed on the prize and not be distracted by the views and the opinions of the world. Thank you.